Hello, my friend. Hey. How are you? How are you? Can you hear? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No, you are in the distance. Hold on. Mike. Well, while you you fix your mic, I just want to introduce everybody to the New Theory Podcast. I am Jason Venturelli, your new host of New Theory Podcast. Tom Lavecchia is still in the background helping produce this show, but I will be taking over. We are going to be talking about business, entrepreneurship, sales, everything happy in life. We'll talk about family, money, everything that makes us uh, keep ticking and waking up in the morning. But without further ado, we have a very special guest, a friend of mine, Vinny Bracco from Brooklyn. Vinny has an amazing story. Well, I think it's an amazing story, and I think you guys will too. Um, Raised in Brooklyn, uh, was on the streets, grew up around wise guys, but he took the educated, straight lifestyle, went to school, went on to Wall Street, made a lot of money. And then later in his life, he decided to go another route, which we will get into, which I found very interesting. But this podcast is strictly uh, about entrepreneurship and business. So everything, whether it be um, the streets, organized uh, crime or the legal business, we are always going to be talking about business, the money involved whether it's legal or illegal, and the guests that we have here. So, again, without further ado, Vinny, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for joining me. How are you today? I'm good, Jason. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. So, I think we might have a little bit of an audio issue here. You're you're kind of in the background. Yeah, I uh, I have it high. I could actually try to come on with another device if that's easier for you. You want to just stay like this? Well, let me see if I can fix it on my end here. Hold on. Well, either way, let's hope that this comes out great because uh, we are uh, we are going to get ready here. We're recording, so um, let's go here. So you can hear me okay, though, right? Yeah, are we on yet? Yes, we are on. Okay. I All right. Well, you. I can hear you faintly. I hope I hope the <laughs> I hope the audience is going to be able to hear you. But you can hear me good, right? I can hear you. Yeah, it's low. Okay. Well, hey, listen. Our first show here will mine, so we are going to have some difficulties and we'll have to iron them out. So, Vinny, listen. Uh, I want to first get into growing up in Brooklyn. Your parents, what was your childhood like, you know, as far as your your home life, uh, going out into the streets, and again, your, your, your family life. Tell, me a little, tell us a little bit about yourselves, the neighborhood, and the family well, life. Well, I grew up in um, Long Island. Uh, I was very young. I had asthma, and unfortunately, my parents, instead of moving out to Arizona, brought me to Brooklyn. I guess it was a drier climate there. Came there about seven years of age in Bensonhurst, and... Um, hung out until I was about uh, 10. Then we went to West 8th Street and West 8th Street, you know, I'm 10. I can understand what's going on in the world. My dad was a street guy. He always worked and uh, started getting the flavor of what Benson Nurse was like. You have to remember it was 1970. So it was a little different than it is now. Or yeah, give us a, give us a time. time. We want to give away your age here, but from when, you know, when was your adolescent years? Uh, late 60s, early 70s. I'm 60. Okay. So it was a, a lot different time, you know, uh, the neighborhoods where I grew up originally was State Street. Everybody was on their stoop. We called it a stoop. Um, yeah, just like the Bronx Tale, used right? Their basements. The two metal trap doors were open. People would use their basements to live and just slept upstairs. These were the houses, you know, on the West Streets. So, um, yeah, things were much different in that day. And I was a kid, so I didn't know much about anything. Uh, then we moved to uh, Faith 20th, which is right around the corner from 18th Avenue. And now I'm a teen and I'm starting to see people and how they act and started gambling a bit. I'm 17, 18, learned the social club is a couple of blocks away. 
found the bookmaker and and then you, you start really uh you have friends from all over the place oh i know this bookmaker i know this one so you start meeting people and seeing the way it is in the real world which was our world you know All right. Can you see me now? I hear you. All right. We got you. So continue. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I started meeting guys and then as you get a little older, now you're, you know, you hit 19, 20, you know, they, they, they look at you a little differently. You're not, you know, it's amazing. Go look at your high school picture from the time you're 18 to 22. You look like you gained 10 years. So they start treating you a little more adult like, you know, when you're still a kid at 17, 18. When you're 22, you know, they have a lot of guys in the street at 22. So they look at you a little more capable, just not with your hands or just making money, just capable as an adult. You know, they right. try to see what you're about. At 17, they don't give a damn. So then I started, you know, meeting some people and not doing anything illegal. Just uh, I, I knew enough people where people knew not that I was around anybody, but that I was hanging out with the crowd that was considered the in crowd in the neighborhood, which are, you know, the guys that are respected, a couple of wise guys and stuff like that. Right, uh, right, right. And let's touch base uh, back on your father. Your father was a, a a straight guy. He had a job or he was mixed in both worlds. Mixed in both worlds. Mixed in both worlds. After the nine to five, he went to the, the social club. Yeah, he was out at night uh, in bars and stuff like that. A loan shocking, stuff like that. Right, right. And and at a young age, would he bring you around that element, you know, just not to get you involved, but um, just because you were his kid? Hey, come down to the club with me. Come have some, you know. No. No. no, because by the time my dad got ill, about 37, he had a stroke. He was fine, but he was pretty much out of that stuff by then. So I was a kid when he was really involved. By the time I'm in my 20s, he had been ill already. He was on disability now. By then, really not involved much. So he didn't take me really anywhere to speak of. I was all on my own doing that stuff. Right, right, right. So let's go into your education. You did good in high school. Uh, I did okay in high school. I got a great mark on my SAT because it was never about being smart. It was about cutting class. But I got a right. good mark on my SAT. I got into a couple of different colleges. Um I ended up going to NYU, and I was still a screw up, but I got through. And then I got my master's later in life. But let's go. Let's go. Let's take it back a little bit. So NYU, you got in expensive school. Your dad yeah. paid for it. Student loans. How did that go? Yeah, it was. I think it was like five or six thousand back then. It wasn't that much. Student loans, Pell and BEOG, they called it back then. Um, yeah, and and got gotcha. student loans from the Dime Savings Bank. I remember. And I uh, <laughs> did that and then just wallowed a bit. I, I worked at Merrill Lynch in 1981 while I was going to school. Uh, started. You That's interned started. there. Excuse me? You interned at Merrill Lynch? Yeah, yeah. Cash management account, CMA. I, I was a part-timer there this way I could go to school. And um, then they moved to Somerset, New Jersey, like in 83. So I wasn't going there because I didn't have a car at that time. It was all the way out in Jersey. So I uh, went to Prue Base on 100 Gold Street. One of the guys that I was very good friends with who passed of cancer, Frank Simo, great guy, he went to Prue Base because he didn't want to go to Somerset either. And he got me the job there at Somerset because one of the uh, executives from Merrill Lynch, Joe Gambali, who Miller Field in Staten Island we used to play football with, uh, he went to Prue Base. He didn't go with Merrill. So he remembered me because we used to play touch football and stuff. In, at Miller Field, and he hired me there, so I was there, and that nice. was in my early twenties. So Merrill Lynch, so Merrill Lynch is where it started. Yeah, fifty-five water. Yeah, nice, nice. Okay, so from there, um, you made your money, and you were what were you doing? Cold calling? You were doing three hundred calls a day. I mean, uh, no, no, not with that. With that, I, I was really just working cash management accounts back then. They were the only 
place that had a debit card attached to a bank account and people would, uh, you know, dispute stuff. And we'd go to One Liberty Plaza, OLP. There was a little shuttle bus every half hour from 55 Water. And back then you had microfiche. And I'd have to go through all the fees to, to get the guy's signature on the credit card receipt, make a report. So that's really, I was a clerk. That's all I did. A and clerk. My friends also. Well, Frank wasn't. He worked full time. He didn't go to college. Right out of high school, he worked in the vault. But uh, yeah, it was. I think I made about five fifty an hour, 6000 an hour. That's all I made. And no, and no connection through your father or a friend of a friend to get into that life? No. Right. Not at all. Actually, it was yeah. a girlfriend that I had, like 17 or 18 she was, and her brother, who was with IBM, was dating a girl from Merrill Lynch. And she asked if I wanted a job part-time. I don't know how it came up. And she, Roseanne, and she's the one that got me the job. Right, all right. So, okay, so let's let's fast forward now. So from there, you're working, and you're like, this banking, finance, this is for me, this is what I want to do with my life. Yeah. And so what's the next step from there? Where do you go? Where do you see yourself? Like, I want to become this. I see this guy. This is where I want to be. I want to have the corner desk in Manhattan. Like, where did you see yourself in that financial world? At that age, I didn't see myself anywhere, honestly. In fact, you know, that at that age, at like 21, uh, 22, we had the key to the time clock. And I'd be at Aqueduct half the day. And my friend would be clocking me in. We were making more money than the... Uh, <laughs> the full timers. <laughs> it's terrible. But that's what we were doing. I didn't see myself as anything, honestly. It was just a part time job for me. And then yeah. I went to Pru Base. When I went to Pru Base, it was a full time job. And I remember uh, I went there in eight, around 84 because I remember the Challenger in 85. I was there when we put the television on in there. But uh, that was it. I was a, a screw around. I worked security at a club shout in Manhattan when I was 24. Uh, that was pretty much it. I really started taking seriously, starting taking things seriously toward the late eighties when I got engaged and I said, I better do something. Now, when we say late eighties, now we all know about the crash in 87 black Monday. Are you saying before that time you were there for then after, after. then? What? After, after around 88, 88. Okay. So, the stock market picks back up. Everybody's going nuts. 88, everything's back to normal, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so now your next move. You see Kidder what? You, you're, I put I'm an sorry? Application, I put an application in for Kidder Peabody, a good stock brokerage at the time. And I remember yeah. I was making, in 1988, about 26000 a year, which wasn't terrible. You know, I didn't have that much experience or anything. Uh, I had most of the college done. And then I uh, continued. And then in the 90s, got my master's when I went back. And uh, I worked for Kidder for a few years, went to the Equitable in 90, in um, 91, went to the Equitable. And life and health, that's all. And I saw to make money, you know, life and health, I was making, I don't know, half the policy. If the policy was 3000 for the year, I got 1500 within two weeks. Uh, what happened was I signed one for Universal Life because it's connected to the stock market, universal to uh, financial instruments, I couldn't write that policy. I got like $100 for it, but the broker made like 1000 I said, oh, this shit isn't going to fly. So I, I started getting sponsored. They wouldn't sponsor me because they were an insurance company. So what I did was I went to Bass Stearns. I, I hawked and hawked and hawked, and I, I got that, and they sponsored me. For your Series 7, you need to be sponsored. So I got sponsored there. And that's when I went back and, and got my degree, master's, and uh, worked hard for a few years. Why? Right. So master's. Okay. So now the money starts coming in when? When you start saying, this is for me, this now nah, you're making real uh, I money. I wasn't making any money really until, uh, you know, negligible, but uh, maybe around. Um, 95 i started making about 100 and then but i was working hard you gotta remember i was going to scores with clients till four in the morning and getting up at seven in the morning having to go again it was hard and, and you know back then you could cold call jason because before the made off stuff and everything now you can't cold call no one would trust you but no. back then you could so i'd have college kids i'd be paying them like ten dollars and they'd be making 100 calls just to get me through the gatekeeper I just wanted the appointment. Once I got the appointment, 
I felt confident enough that I could maybe right. get something. But you need things in your funnel, like sales, you know. You need a, mm-hmm. enough in your funnel where something's going to hit. And and I, I was pretty diligent and I worked hard. I did work hard. And I had a you know, I had gotten married in ninety and you know, by ninety six, ninety seven I had a two year old and it was rough. It was rough. I was and how old are you at this point? Young. You know, I was thirty six years old. Thirty six. So thirty six, you're doing around a hundred a year. About a hundred. Okay. So now you're working your way up or you're just maintaining the same position. You, you see there's more money to be made because um, go ahead. there was more money to be made, but you had to really work very hard for it. And at that point in 96, I started uh, moving the games and I was, I met someone on a plane going from Vegas back to New York and he was with a bunch of guys, you know, the night owl to get back. And we uh, hooked up. I was betting at the time, and it, my, his voice sounded familiar after about three months, and it was him. So we ended up getting together, and uh, he told me what he did. It was for MIT and for all these people. Billy Walt is a big shot gambler. And my regular job waned. I still worked it, but there was so much cash being made on the other end. I probably wasn't as hungry as I would have been if I was just working the one job, you know? Right, right. So now nine to five or I don't know, nine to seven. Yeah. Right. So you're doing your job on the side here. You're doing some gambling. Yes. And you kind of just, you know, (laughs) raised over the MIT thing. So the gambling. Now you meet somebody who has the connection with Billy Walters, MIT. And for those of you who don't know, uh, when we talk about MIT, we're talking about that blackjack crew that went out to Vegas and was counting cards. Right. And there was a movie done with uh, Kevin Spacey about that. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. This was a different crew. Same, same basic idea, but these were the sports gamblers, not the blackjack players. There were a bunch of people involved in stuff. These were, there were about 12 or 15 of them. These were the sports guys. Right. Uh, The MIT guys I never dealt with that were doing the blackjack. Right. And and everybody at MIT, you know, there's the guys that do, you know, programming and they make, you know, millions into programming. And, and, you know, now you got the sports betting or the black, black blackjack games in Vegas. So there was a lot of crews, you know, yes. that came out of MIT and kind of made their own way in different markets and made millions, whether it was again, um, off market, you know, in the illegal doing it illegally or legally. Um, but so this crew, was a different crew that did the sports gambling, correct? Right, right. So now you're working, you're work, you're working your day job. Mm-hmm. You're doing the sports betting, getting the information with your partner at the time through the MIT guys. And what are you doing? You're you're taking the you're 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 pushing the action off onto a local street guy. I mean, even then, I mean, I don't even think the online sports bets, uh, uh online sports betting was around. So you're yeah. taking it from your local you know corner guy, correct? Yeah, he he had it set up already where he had an apartment building in Elmhurst uh, and uh, an apartment. And we would go in. We had five or six bookmakers on auto dial and they would call us uh, Jets minus six. We have all our guys in speed dial. What's the line? Now, we were beating them because you weren't hooked up into computers back then. And uh, so they would call us back two minutes. What would you get for us? Uh, We got the Jets minus six for uh, 15,000. Uh, 3,000 at lane seven, stuff like that. And we'd get calls throughout the day, football, during college and pro. And we got 10% of whatever they won. There was a guy in uh, a laundromat king is the guy we would settle up with every week. Uh, owned Harry, he owned the many laundromats. And we would settle up cash with him. And then once every three or four weeks, we go to Vegas and bring money. You know, sometimes 100, sometimes but 60, you're taking. 70. So you're not even putting out your own money. No. You're taking 10%. So mm-hmm. yeah, who, who's, the, who's the bank here? Hmm? These MIT kids aren't the bank. Who's the bank? Billy Walters. Who We're your friend knew. Him. And Bill. Right. Okay. We're so a guy like best. Billy Walters, a guy like Billy Walters and these and sharks and big sharks out there, you know, they can't just walk into a Vegas casino and put, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 no. on. These no. guys got to find 
different avenues. You know, maybe he'll send a runner to, you know, two casinos and another runner to another two casinos. Right. And he's got to switch those runners up in Vegas. Then he'll maybe go to a local guy like you in New York, a local guy in L.A., Miami, wherever, all across the nation. So no, just for him I, to get off $300,000 in bets, yeah, he's got to have 10 guys out there. I heard that he had probably at one time over 100. Chicago or any big city. Uh, Yeah, Chicago too, yeah. 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 And yeah. yeah, we were just a small part of it. Wow, wow. Okay, so let's get back. So you're doing that. You're whining and dining at night. I mean, you're working your ass off nine to eight, whatever, seven. I mean, you're you're just, you're, you know, burning the midnight oil, right? And how long did this go for? Um, how long did this go for? I left work in 99. You left work in 99. But was there some point, and we, we, when everybody thinks of Wall Street, you know, to this day, you know, they think of 500,000, 400, 500, 600,000. You know, I have a friend who's a banker in the city. You know, he's up there in those numbers. In your Wall Street career, were you up in those numbers? 500. 500. So what was yeah, your base? What, I'm back sorry? Then they gave bon back then they gave bonuses. Right. So what was your base? 200 and 300 bonus? 240. 240. What's that? 240. 240. Okay. At the highest. Yeah. 240. And the rest would be your bonus. Now, and what firm was this with at, at uh, Bear Stearns? Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns. And Bear Stearns that inevitably fell apart in 2008 with the crash. Yeah. yeah right. Correct. Park Avenue. Yeah. Right. So, but you left in 99, Bear Stearns. Around 90. Yeah. I think January 99. And how long of a run? And exactly what was your position at Bear Stearns pulling in 500,000 a year? What was your, what was your uh, title? Well, what did you do? Well, we, they had me down as a director of global marketing, but really, you know, they give people titles so they don't have to pay them. You know, you look at kids and they'll say, well, make your VP or $50 more a week. I'll take the <laughs> VP card because it's impressive. You know, that's what they used to do to the young guys. If you know banks, everybody's a VP in a bank because they could do that instead of giving you money. But, uh, yeah, I was uh, like an assistant director. What they, I was behind the scenes in sales and, um, you know, people that manage small cap funds. There was uh, They were do, dealing with mortgage-backed securities. I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and stuff like that. And I would just had a team. Were you, were, were you on this? Are you on the sell side or you were just – you know, the orders come in, you execute orders. Like, what side of that were you sell on? Sell side. The sell side. Okay. Sell side. Yeah. Okay. So, you had a book of clients. You would get new clients, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'd have to smooth those clients, right? Maintain them. Yeah. Maintain them. Maintain them, them right? Yeah. And your performance would indicate your bonus, right? Right. Right. If something was expiring, coming off the books to keep them going. If someone's uh, family member died that left them the money, convince them to stay there. You know, that, that happened a lot where someone would be left $10 million. Right. And then, you know, why would they stay with us? Right. So we would have to convince them, you know, stay here. That was your parents. Right. Keep your money here. Right. And that was a lot of it. And that's what the bonuses were. And what maintain. was right. And what was like, like, you can't go to Goldman Sachs with, you know, uh, 500,000 in your account. You got to have minimum, I think, of even at the small level, I think of 5 million or 10 million. What was your like? You don't talk to anybody who doesn't have a net worth of under. It was uh, back then. It was a million five. A million five to get into the door to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Now they had smaller, uh, smaller accounts there that you could have 300,000 in or something, but that wasn't going to the director department. That was going more into the stock brokerage, cash management accounts, all that stuff. Gotcha. 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 So you're making this kind of money. Um, something happens. You had to stop working. Yeah, I, I just and that, I was I, I was getting lazy. You were burnt. I'm getting very lazy, and uh, I didn't want to work the late nights anymore. They were doing a little reorganization, and I would have had to have the hours. You know, now my my son is four, and uh, where I my wife was working from home a lot. Now she was out. And I felt, you know, I'll stay home. And I was making enough money with the other things. Gotcha. Right, right. And and the the side income became a real 
money maker, and that was kind of easy to walk away from the five hundred k. Correct. Uh, well, the bonuses had stopped, so I was making. Oh, the bonuses had stopped. That's right. Two fifty. Okay, even two two forty. That's a lot of money. <laughs> two forty. That was a lot of money, but I was making. You know, some weeks I made fifteen thousand with the other thing, four thousand. But you got to remember, we're moving. Uh, if they win two hundred on a weekend, I'm getting we're getting twenty thousand. There's ten each. Wow. And and then there were expenses. You know, our nut was four thousand a month with, you know, rent and all that stuff because we had that apartment. But uh, I didn't want to do anything out of my house. And, and in fact, I came up with this great thing. Like people were getting busted around us. So what I do was we rented two apartments, five G and four G. The phones would be listed to five G. We'd run the wires down the side of the building into 4G. If they have a warrant for you, it's 5G. They go to 5G where the phones are registered. And we'd hear them, we're in 4G. They have no warrant for our apartment. Wow. That's something. That's something. Yeah. So let's, let's again, fast forward. You, so now you're, 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 you, you, you retired, you quit at in 99. So you're not working for anybody. Yeah. Got you. No. Okay. Just home. Got you. Right. So now you have a health incident in 2000. What year was that? What? The health incident? Yeah. 2003. Uh, I was with my son. He was about eight. Going, uh, you know, you have to lean down the Water bottles on the bottom, right around the corner from our house, lunch, uh, candy store. And uh, I woke up in the hospital. And wow. came over. Did you take your insulin? I said, what insulin? So they looked at my bracelet to make sure it was really me. They said, you're, sure, you're not diabetic? I said, no. My sugar was like 700. I had a stroke. They said, you know, you had a stroke. Now, they can't tell you had a stroke with a CAT scan today. It would show up a week later. But they said, you've had, how have you felt? You're not thirsty? You're not urinating. I said, I'm always up late, which I always was. So I figured I'm just tired all the time. You know, I was only like at that point. I'm like, uh, what was I back then in 2003? You know, I'm like uh, 43 or whatever. And I just, uh, yeah, I was tired, but I attributed it to just being tired, getting up at three in the morning. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's when they found out I was diabetic. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I slowed down a bit. I just slowed down on purpose, try to just feel better. And I was always running around. And I was then in 2007, I was diagnosed with bipolar. And a lot of it mm -hmm. made sense. The constant running around at night, the loving the action. You know, there are a lot of people that aren't bipolar and like that stuff. But my right. world was a little too chaotic. I, I always had to be on the move, continually on the move. And people would say like, yeah, you know, you're doing 10 things tonight. What's going on with you? And uh, it, it explained a lot when I sat down after I was diagnosed and thought about it. I said, yeah, maybe I really was. <laughs> you know? Wow. Wow. So, so all that's going on. And, and you don't, you're, there's no W2 on you. There's no 1099 for a number of years. You're just, you're cash. Yeah. Yeah. Cash, but my wife had always worked, and she made really she made over six figures. She was a first a top executive at Nine X, and then went to the government, and right. it was like a fourteen level fourteen. So she made good money. So we showed it, you know, we had income, right? But, but you couldn't show you couldn't show what you you know you you, you couldn't go out and buy a million dollar house even though you could afford it because no. then <laughs> no, but, but we could, you know you could have two cars. On that side, no one would question you. They didn't have a rolls out, so right? Or so no one's questioning you. You know, I only had one child. Always have one child. So and yeah. it was an apartment. I rent. I never bought. So I had an apartment. So no one's going to really question you. I wasn't out there spending tons of money. You know, I fit into the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. So now let's again go fast forward another couple years, and now you decide to go into business. Uh, with uh, some gentlemen, but going to business on your own, essentially. Um, and, and what and what was that? What year? And what did you do? Tell me that story. 
I, I really couldn't hear you. What year? What with the club? So we fast forward to I don't I I'm not sure what year because we spoke early before this interview, but fast forward to 2000, circle 2009, oh, 8, now. 10, 11, where you could decide to go into business for yourself. Uh, well, uh, after 2007, I recouped for a year and a half, two years, and then a friend of mine at a social club. I had always gambled in that social club. I knew him for years. So he had a problem with his cousin who was robbing him. So he asked me to come in because I would deal with him. He knew I moved games. I knew him that long. So he, um, he asked me to come in just until after the Super Bowl and run the place because he had no idea. He's an old Italian, not an old guy, but he had no clue of gambling. So I came in to the club. I took it over, became a partner in the club. Not now knowing. you had a buy-in? What? Yeah. Yeah, 10000 You had to buy in. You had to put up your own cash. 10000 This We put twenty in the kit because we didn't have big players. And I took a lot of players that I had. I bought a bookmaker out that had quite a few customers that I used to deal with in the 90s. They knew me. So I opened up the islands and had people. My friend was still in the islands. I reconnected with him, the guy I used to move with. We hadn't been together since he had gone to Costa Rica in 2001. So like 13, 14 years. So reconnected with him. He's in Costa Rica and uh, a lot of common players. So even though I was only making, I don't know, a thousand a week in the club, um, but I'm again in the high numbers with the players. I had a couple of people that collected for me. So I'm in that club, but never knowing that the guy that my partner, who he kicked out his cousin for, for kind of robbing, uh, it was under investigation already. And I, I had no idea. They've been under investigation for two years already when I went in. And uh, one morning, February 8th, I believe, 2011, it's in, it's in the paper. Uh, six o'clock in the morning, my wife at the time knocks on the door, uh, not, uh, wakes me up and says, the police are at the door. I said, what? Six agents, they walk in. I'll never forget. I said, you think you have enough guys? And one of them laughed. And I knew what they would have. I, I knew it was the club, but it couldn't be anything else. I wasn't really involved in anything else. Right. And they searched the house. They got 80000 out of the safe. Uh, the, it was the Enterprise Corruption Organized Crime Task Force State. And my son was having issues at the time. And they had heard I was bugged for three months. I was followed. And uh, they, they I'll never forget the cop said, I'm looking in your eyes. I'm a father. you have anything to hide in his room? And I said, no. And they said, close the door, let him sleep. I thought it was really cool. I know a lot of people don't like cops. That was a cool thing. Uh, I thought that was very cool. And they took all the electronics out of the house. And I said, that's his iPad. I said, he'll be, I can't, and they let me keep the iPad too. Well, it was his. So they, they were fair with me. In fact, they right. went over to my wife and said, he's the only one without a gumad, and that includes a 75-year-old. They said, get him a good lawyer. He has bad friends. Because they felt within those four walls, I was a criminal. The other guys they right. felt walked around like they had a license. And ultimately, one guy did nine months because he walked around like he had a license. The oldest guy in the crew, actually, he was like 64. He did nine at Rikers, nine months. But so, yeah, I, I was devastated. They took every every dollar I had that they, they froze the bank accounts to save the box, which I didn't have much money in, but it was enough to sustain. I had a bail hearing. I had to scurry around because I had to show where the money came from. Ten thousand dollars, anything over five thousand, it's a bad hell hearing. They have to approve where the money's coming from. You have to show bank receipts and shit, and the yeah. banks were locked out. They were frozen, so it was hard to, to get it. In fact, at the, my wife had gone to her cousin, who was an attorney, embarrassing to straight family, telling what happened, and he gave her the money. And because he's an attorney, he's a reputable guy. You know, they right. they they have to agree with it. The bail bondsman, the DAS will agree where the money is coming from. So, um, and they offered me the plea. They said, uh, who's this, who's that? I said, I have no idea. And they said, what do you mean you have no idea? You're in London Lenny's all the time. And I said, don't know what to tell you. So they said, you're going to do 18 months for obstruction. I said, well, can I eat first? And then you can take me and get me away from my neg and my I think kid. They said, get him the fuck out of here. So, so I was facing five years, the 18 months for obstruction. Uh, I agree that they took the 80000 I didn't fight for it. I probably wouldn't have won it back anyway, but it ties the money up. If I let it go now, they can just... Right. I forfeited the 80000 took 
the C felony because I wasn't willing to say anything about anybody. So I took the C, which I didn't want to take a C felony. I could have gotten off with a misdemeanor, but I wouldn't give anybody up. And um, took the C felony. I figured at that age, you know, I was 49 at that age, 50. I said, I'm not going back to work anyway. It, what's the C felony going to do? You know, I didn't care. I, I wasn't looking to get in trouble again. So I figured, oh, I, what do I have to worry? I had uh, non-report probation. That was part of giving the money up. Um, that they would give me non-report because they knew my son was having some problems. And I told the judge. And my lawyer goes like, they says, do you want to say something? Because I'm talking to the, my attorney. And the judge says, you want, and my attorney goes like this, like, oh my God. I said, Your Honor, I, I you know, I'm bipolar. I didn't use that as an excuse. Uh, I know what I did, but my son is having issues and I just got him out of the house. And I know in probation, if you have a probation officer, the first few months, they don't let you do anything. He's playing AAU. It was winter. He was playing hockey. I said, if they don't let me take him, he'll be set back. He asked the DA, and I'll never forget the DA said, we stand silent. Meaning it's your decision. So he gave me where I went to non-report. I met the probation officer right after getting sentenced in the next room. And they said, uh, if you, the judge said, if you get caught here again, whether me or whomever, you're doing five years. It's Christmas, a late Christmas gift for you. That's what they said. And uh, I got non-report. And then after re about two years, they, they, you know, they'll cut your probation sometimes. And they'll say, uh, we cut it. And they cut it. I got a relief from disabilities, which means I could do everything but run for office. And that saved my license. Because I had to go for, before the board to save my license. Yeah. And, uh, but I got a relief from disabilities. I can't run for office. I can vote. I can do everything else. So that was pretty cool. Because generally, you can get in other states um, expunged. They don't expunge felonies in New York. They don't do it. Because I wouldn't right. pay now. Right, 10 years. Like, I can't go to Canada. My son likes to go to the Ranger games. I'm right, afraid right, they won't right. let me in. So what I'm going to do is uh, you can apply for forgiveness in Canada. And it's long enough now where they'll let you in. But I'm afraid to go with him. They might not let me in. Right, but right, I'm, right. So No need to you know, take the I, risk. I've stayed clean. Uh, I don't deal with those people anymore because there's no reason to. You know, I don't do that stuff anymore. So why would I see them? Once in a while, I saw one in the gym, actually, the, my old partner. I used to visit him in Rikers for the nine months but i started mm -hmm. to hey how you doing what's going on gave him a kiss alone but that was it i i, I don't see those people anymore i think i've been yeah. two in the last 10 years at I, your I peak Vin. at your peak and we could just touch a little bit about um that's an amazing story actually but we, i want to touch at your peak in in the bookmaking industry uh what's What's a day in the life? Give us, before we go here, well, give us a day in the life. You know, you, you woke up at 8 o'clock in the morning. You were at the social club by 9. You're looking at the lines. Bets are coming in by 12. Who's collecting where? How many runnies you got? 10,000, you know, every week, 60,000 every week. Give us a day in the life or a week in the life um, of, the, of that, that game. Well, when I had the club, I get up around 8.30. Uh, because there were a lot of cash bets, people would come, you know, when they win that air at 9.30 in the morning. I'd go get the racing forms, uh, the, the books, put on the coffee. By 10 a.m., I was in the office. You had people collecting or, uh, you know, getting ready for the horses. People came in to bet in the afternoon because I didn't have the lines till 12 or 12.30. Uh, I was there till 5, closed the club, but then I'm doing all the work at night. Football tickets, I had probably 500 football tickets. I had a couple of people grading with me on the weekends. It was a lot of work. I, the work. I did. I probably worked 15 hours a day in the club. And thank God I had the, the people in the islands betting because it wasn't worth it. I think I was, well, the joke of poker machines were taking 5000 a month. The rent was 2000 a month. So that covered everything. But just uh, just a pain in the ass because I was because the guy, my partner, knew nothing. I mean, I had to do everything. But, but I mean, people think that, you know, you were actually running a business. You know, you're, you're back to the hours again, grinding, right? I mean, this is, was a lot of work. Absolutely. It's, it's harder to not work than to work. It's easier to work a job. Gotcha. I hear you. And and what and at your peak, give us, you know, your best month, you know, the, the operations best month, 100,000, 100,000 a week, five, 400,000 a month. I mean, and as a small operation, what, what 
I mean, okay, were you a small operation? Were you considered a small operation? Were you considered a medium, large, what? The club the club is very small. Small. My op- what does a small operation bring? A million in? a year. A million a year. A million a, a year, million a year small operation. Yeah, a million a year. You know, we, we wow. made maybe 50 a piece. Wasn't and how many out. guys did you have go? And how many guys did you have going out there collecting for you? We had three partners. I had three clerks that worked different days, you know, and um, you know, just basic shit. <laughs> really, uh, it was a lot more in the life when I was moving games, not working, because that's when I'm going to different bars, I'm going to restaurants, I'm meeting people, I'm. Um, you know, not getting going till mid afternoon because you know, in the islands when they're my moving games really was on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. That there weren't all the football games every night of the week, and you know back then. So really, they weren't playing baseball. It was football season, so we were really on the weekends busy. But we'd roam around. We'd go to Little Italy. You know, I knew the owner of Ferraris. I, back then, they had the cafe. They don't have it anymore. Now it's just a bakery. We'd go and have a cigar and sit with us and Buka and we'll do all that shit. Played a part. But we were dealing with offices that were big offices. They were real guys. So yeah. you know, we'd meet with them and just as, hey, how you doing? You know, and that would be the deal there. It wasn't that we were gangsters. But, you know, I always say if you're putting pe- money in people's pockets, they treat you much better than, than the hired help that break legs. Because the yeah. bottom line is money. But you're, you're in that environment. You're, you're in that environment. You're in that world. The guys are around, they're either loan sharks, they're either bookmakers themselves, they're made guys. So for that time period, you went from, let's go back to the beginning of our story, where you were a straight guy, and you stayed off the streets, and you went, got edu- you know, got educated, went to the W-2 or 1099 or whatever you call it, but you were living that straight life, working for big firms, and... You know, later in life, you know, come full circle, you're on the streets, as they say, um, running a business on the, uh, you know, running a big business on the streets, you know? Yeah, yeah. It ended up, That's yeah, fascinating, though. Business. That really is fact. It's fascinating that at, at 18, 19, 20, you said, no, I'm not doing this. I'm going this way. Right. And then, you know... It just either sucks you back in or it's just you're around that environment. And just like give me it. your what what made you what I'm trying to get is what made you get sucked back into that life? Was it you weren't working? Was it the money? Was it the downtime? What 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 was it that at 18 you didn't do it, but at, at 40, 50 something years old you did? It was gambling. The the, it was the a gambling liking, the gambling in the nightlife. You love the action. The action. The lights camera action that's what i like yeah it's not brokerage's action but it ends when you come home this was 24 7 for me and yeah. that's where the bipolar comes in where i feel i always wonder jason if i wasn't bipolar if i would have gotten sucked into all that yeah and and that's the question i always ask myself and i maybe never have an answer for it but uh, i always wondered if the bipolar because mine was mania manic that was my problem and i mm-hmm. always wondered if the mania caused me to need that excitement yeah yeah so i mean that's that's an amazing story and and everybody watching you know so me and Vinny are friends and so i knew a little bit about his story and i just thought it was so interesting when he told it to me that i just had to hear more and i definitely wanted to share it with my with you guys so Vinny, i appreciate you sharing that and uh listen tell everybody where they can find you what you got going on now and uh Go ahead. I have um, Brooklyn Guy Vinny Bracco. That's my channel, YouTube. It is uh, dedicated to really mental health. I try to help people with bipolar, but it's a hybrid channel. I talk a little bit about mob genre, although I want to get away from that because it's annoying. You know, uh, to, you talk. I notice when I talk about it, I get excited again. <laughs> I'm being serious because it brings me back. Switch to goes off. Yeah, it brings me back to youth, exciting stories. I never want, I, I know I would never do it again. And I really, that's the reason. I never let bipolar define me. But because I've had opportunities to get back in the street. And I believe the medication, I realize the detriment that it would cause. So I wonder, is it I'm older that I got in trouble? Or is it really I'm medicated? 
and I'm not bipolar anymore, so I don't need it. Right. Don't know, but whatever the case is, the YouTube mm -hmm. channel helps me. I'm with the Four Horsemen, with you and Tom and yes. uh, Joe, and it really helps me because I like a group setting. I enjoy it. Working with you guys, I like friendship. I have friends for 45 years that I still yeah. talk to every couple of days, and I like that environment. And going off on my own with the YouTube helped me to meet you guys. So right there, it was worth, I helped one person who called me from Canada that had an illness and the kid is now in rehab. And Good. so without subscribers, I could kill us. It helped one kid. And that's all I wanted to do with my channel to show yeah. that you can live a pretty good life, even if you're mentally ill, but you really have to kind of try a little you can't just expect the world to help you you got to go out there and try a little yourself and that's what i'm doing with the four horsemen we do a lot of fun things with my own channel brooklyn guy vinnie bracco i try to make it a hybrid channel where i have a lot of the uh, subscribers in the chat i intermingle with them a lot uh, i do some interviews like tonight i'm doing an interview at eight o'clock with justice tech pros and he is the son of uh, stephen Crea, dominic Crea. And it's going interesting. To be a great, yep. uh, if, if anyone's available, watch that. It's going to be terrific. And I want to get more into the interview side. Tom Levecki has been a big muse to me. You know, Tom, because he's a wonderful interviewer. And his uh, Armchair MBA is an amazing channel. Your new theory that you've just taken over is amazing. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to go around mm -hmm. out there. And I, I think if you help one person, right, the best is helping one person that you may never meet. Right. You changed yeah. their world I agree. and it's paying it back, right? I agree. I agree. And, you know, that's the that's the theme of the show, along with the business category, the entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. you know, sales and and just living a good life, you know, treating each other kind. Um, and, and that's what we're bringing, you know, your show, this show, Tom's show, uh, the Four Horsemen. So but yes, um, Vinny, thank you so much. It's You're a pleasure welcome. to look at your handsome face and to be around your aura all the time. So Vinny Bracco, Brooklyn guy. Guys, check him out on YouTube. He does a lot of live streams. He's a great guy to talk to. So YouTube, um, what would it be, Vinny? It would be uh, Brooklyn guy, Vinny Bracco. Brooklyn guy. And they'll just find your channel, correct? Thank you, Jason. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, listen, Wonderful I'll see you soon, buddy. I'll thank you. Bye-bye. Be well. All right, guys. So thank you for joining me tonight. That was our very special guest, Vinny Bracco. Guys, tune in next time for the New Theory podcast. Again, I'm Jason Venturelli. I'm your new host. We are going to bring you um, a lot of businessmen, uh, women talking about entrepreneurship, how they got started, uh, where they are now. Um, and just again, a lot of positive vibes from this podcast, and uh, we want a lot of learn things about business. We're going to do live streams. People can ask our guests questions, ask me questions. Um, and again, Tom Lebecki is still involved in this program. He's helped producing this these shows. So, guys, be kind. I'm Jason Mentorelli. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time. Take care.